Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we're going to kick off right into updates. We'll turn it over to Dr. Pinsky, who's going to update regarding the variants, of course. Thanks. Thanks, Errol. Uh, so I'll give a brief update on the variants. Of course, uh, the new variant Omicron has been in the news. Uh, we don't know a lot about it uh, as of yet, but I'll give a brief uh, summary of what we do know so far and what we're looking for. Uh, so this is Pango lineage B11529. It's quite different from the other variants that uh, we've seen so far. In particular, it has a very large number of spike mutations, including mutations in the N-terminal domain and in the receptor binding domain. Uh, and it has a number of uh, well-characterized mutations, including N501Y, which was found originally in alpha, as well as K417N um, and E484 change were more common, more commonly E484K, but this has E484A. So these are likely to um, impact the binding of antibodies and neutralization of this virus and may impact uh, vaccine efficacy. Of course, this virus was first identified in Southern Africa, reports from originally from South Africa and cases in Botswana, and has now spread uh, throughout at least 19 countries across the world. Um, and it is a variant of concern uh, uh, upgraded on WH by the WHO on the 26th. Uh, just to illustrate how many mutations are present here, um, on the top is Omicron uh, with all of these mutations, as I mentioned in RBD, as well as in the N-terminal domain of the spike protein, spike gene resulting in changes in the spike protein. And then here's Delta, which has important mutations, but uh, um, you can clearly see uh, they're uh, much more limited than in this particular new variant. Uh, so what are the characteristics of this virus? So uh, these are the things that we want to investigate. Uh, is there increased transmissibility? And you, you see I've underlined here, all this is really uncertain. It's very early right now, uh, but, but uh, hopefully we'll get answers to these soon. Um, this virus has been identified in at least 19 countries, including a number of cases in Canada, Japan, the UK, and the Netherlands. Um, it is expected that there will be reduced susceptibility to monoclonal antibody therapies and potentially uh, response to vaccination. Um, how are still uh, working that out. There's a large number, as I mentioned already, of important, important spike mutations uh, that suggest the resistance to neutralization as well as vaccine decreased vaccine protection. Um, there are some limited reports in the media of um, uh, infection in vaccinated individuals, so breakthrough infections. And then increased severity is also uncertain. There are limited reports suggesting that disease so far has been mild to moderate, though most cases have been in younger individuals. So we'll see again how this uh, plays out. So what about the diagnostics and what's going on here at Stanford? Uh, there's no known impact on the diagnostic testing. So our RT-PCR and nucleic acid amplification tests uh, are able to detect this variant. And the assays that we use here target different regions of the genome, uh, the envelope, nucleocapsid, and ORF1AB region uh, that are very highly conserved. Uh, so we don't anticipate, based on the available sequences, that there will be uh, missed cases. Um, some other laboratories use this Thermo Fisher test. Um, and this test may have spike gene target failure. Um, due to the Delta 6970 mutation. This was used initially as a screen uh, for the alpha variant. Uh, so this may help some labs identify Omicron um, a little bit sooner, but the other two targets in this assay are unaffected. So that's still a good diagnostic assay. So how are we identifying, looking to identify this variant? Uh, we still perform mutation specific RT-PCR screening on all positives that come through our laboratory. And based on the, the mutations that we detect, we can uh, triage for the presence of this Omicron variant. And then we will hold genome sequence to confirm the lineage and uh, uh, confirm identification of this variant. So we should be able to rapidly identify it. So far, no cases, uh, only Delta and the various Delta sublineages of which there are numerous. Um, and so this has been the case for the past uh, over two months. Uh, so we will keep looking uh, for this variant and anticipate that we will find it here in the United States in the Bay Area in the next uh, week or several weeks. So just briefly, uh, we are seeing other respiratory viruses in contrast to the last year's uh, respiratory season, which was only uh, SARS-CoV-2. We are now seeing... Um, 
Well, we've seen a large number of rhinovirus cases. Those are also increasing. That's kind of the light gray in the background. Uh, but you'll notice in orange here, we're seeing a lot more RSV, particularly in pediatrics. Um, we have had a number of influenza A cases as well. Uh, so this is just something to keep out for. You can see also the volume of other respiratory testing is increasing over the last several weeks. Uh, so this is something to keep an eye out for. Um, obviously, the uh, signs and symptoms of upper respiratory infection overlap with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so uh, many people may be presenting with these other respiratory viruses as well. Uh, so keep that in mind. All right, uh, I'm happy to take any questions in the, in the chat and I'll turn it over to our um, moderator. Thank you, Errol. Thank you so much, Dr. Pinsky. While Talia switches over slides, I just wanna say thanks to everybody who's here in person. We'll continue to do these events, the first uh, grand rounds of the month in person. And thanks for the robust uh, number of people who are online watching as well. Uh, please remember, we'll always continue to have Zoom available to everybody. Feel free to ask your questions just like you always do and we'll get them answered. Uh, while uh, we're presenting. I'm gonna now turn it over to Dr. Harrington who's gonna introduce our, our introducer, Dr. Stevenson and our honored uh, speaker, Dr. Sunshine. Thank you, Errol. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to see people here this morning. This is a, uh, a big day for the Department of Medicine. Uh, this is our annual, although we skipped 2020 as, a, uh, as, as an in-person uh, grand rounds for this particular award. We think it is important that this one be celebrated in person. Um, because there is an element of the, uh, the personal aspect of it that I think you'll hear from uh, Dr. Stevenson. So the Albion uh, Walter Hewlett Award was created by Dr. Ken Melman, who was the chair of medicine from 1978 to 1985. The award was created to recognize physicians that were described as having exceptional skills, extraordinary skills, but really were being able to bring together excellent patient care with a scientific basis to it. Uh, this is really an award that goes far beyond the Department of Medicine. In fact, if you look at the award winners, uh, many are outside the Department of Medicine. And from the beginning with Dr. Melman's instruction, that was very uh, purposefully done. It was really to recognize excellence across Stanford, including uh, members of the Stanford community who had no longer been part of the community, and, uh, and, but it was felt to be important that those, uh, that those people be recognized. Uh, the first awardee in 1983 was Dr. Saul Rosenberg. And I think all of us who know Saul would say that there is no better example of a compassionate physician with extraordinary skills who built his patient care on a scientific base. So in 2020, the, uh, the award was uh, awarded to, uh, to Dr. Phil Sunshine, who we have the privilege of having with us today. And as is the ongoing tradition, one of our prior awardees who knows the current awardee quite well will serve as the introducer. So David, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Bob. Well, I'm honored to uh, introduce one of Neonatology's original leaders, Philip Sunshine, uh, for the Albion Walter Hewlett Award. I know how difficult it is to select the few individuals uh, who bring such tremendous records of accomplishment and prestige to the award and are so de deserving of formal acknowledgement by their peers. Phil is one of those few uh, who will join his previously honored friends and colleagues, some of whom are here and uh, or joining us remotely uh, as previous Hewlett awardees. Phil traveled to the um, to Stanford, uh, uh, west of Stanford, uh, from Colorado in the late 1950s, began a career that would span more than five decades, most of it based at Stanford University. He received his BA degree from the University of Colorado in 1952 and his MD from the same institution in 1955. After an internship at Sinai Hospital of Baltimore and a brief military commitment in the US Naval Medical Corps between 1957 and 1959. He completed his medical training at Stanford in the field of pediatrics, choosing happiness over money as his mother had interpreted his career choice. He, he had returned from his military duties just in time to participate in the move of the Stanford University School of Medicine from San Francisco 
to the Stanford campus in 1959, a translocation which transformed the university's biomedical sciences. Phil's first appointment at Stanford was as instructor in pediatrics in 1963. Phil's mentor, Norman Kretschmer, who was also chair of pediatrics, showed Phil how a developmental biochemistry might reshape traditional pediatric investigation, how laboratory-based science could contribute to measurable improvements in infant nutrition and newborn care. While still an instructor in pediatrics, he was appointed the assistant director of the Clinical Research Center for Premature Infants in 1963, one of the very first uh, clinical research centers or GCRCs in the country uh, and dedicated to the study of newborns. By 1967, he was not only the program director of the GCRC, but also the chief of neonatology in the Department of Pediatrics. He rose to the rank of professor by 1973 and was appointed the second holder of the Harold K. Faber Endowed Professorship of Pediatrics at Stanford uh, in 1980. Holding that chair until 1989, when he departed to become chief of the Department of Pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles uh, in 1989. Um, and uh, 1993. He returned to Stanford in 1993, rejoining the Department of Pediatrics and a Division of Neonatal and Developmental Medicine. He was the easiest and the best recruitment that I ever made as division chief. <laughs> in fact, I had kept his secretary employed uh, and continued to keep a mailbox for him the whole time that he was gone. <laughs> Bill was born uh, on June 16, 1930. Here he is at approximately eight months. Phil was a precocious child, surprising his mother with apparent memorization of many of the mother goose nursery rhymes. This talent was an entirely, uh, was an early example of Phil's later impressive ability to internalize vast amounts of scientific information, but even vaster amounts of sayings, jokes, and stories. Here's a picture of Phil in front of the Sunshine Family Store in Denver. During his early years, it became clear that Phil indeed was a quick learner and a very fine student. However, he asked, he asked his mother not to tell any of his friends what grades he got in school. And if they did ask, he instructed her to tell them that he got, got grades just like they got because he did not want them not to like him. His report cards, of course, were nearly always perfect. This anecdote reflects another attribute of Phil, which is his incredible humility and sensitivity towards others. Friends have always meant everything to Phil Sunshine. This next picture shows Phil in his usual formal attire for a scientific meeting. <laughs> the next uh, two photographs are quite extraordinary. I, I did not know that such pictures existed and did not initially recognize the individual in the pictures as Phil Sunshine. But after checking, I confirmed that this is a photograph of Phil wearing his first long pants what confused me, of course, was the fact that Phil had hair. In fact, he had a lot of hair and was quite a handsome young man. This is a picture of Phil, the skinny guy uh, in this picture, um, on his way to California. Of course, California has never been the same, and Phil has seen a lot more than the amount of, his, amount of hair on his head change over the years at, at Stanford. Here's a picture of Phil as he looked near the beginning of his career at Stanford. Although most of us know Phil for his many contributions to neonatology, he also served as director of pediatric gastroenterology at Stanford between 1964 and 1980, making many important contributions in this fledgling field. Many of his original uh, important scientific contributions have come, become so much a part of the history of um, developmental gastroenterology and nutrition that they're easily forgotten. For example, Phil was the first to show that lactose malabsorption can result from acute gastroenteritis, something that general pediatricians now take for granted. This landmark paper was published in Pediatrics in 1964 and is reference number two on Phil's list of publications. Phil and his colleagues, in fact, made many original scientific contributions to understanding the ontogeny of the intestinal saccharidases, with publications in Science in 1964 and Nature in 1966 showing that newborns had delayed intestinal cellular migration, affecting their capacity to recover from injury and digest disaccharides. However, Phil's greatest strength has always been his intellectual versatility and his extraordinary clinical insight. For example, in 1965, he was the first to describe the relationship of neonatal thyroid toxicosis to long-acting thyroid stimulator, later shown to be thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulin. 
In 1972, Phil was the first to describe a child in the United States with ornithine transcarbamylase, OTC deficiency, a urea cycle defect. Phil also was the first to describe hyperammonemia accompanying parental nutrition in newborn infants and to promote, propose a mechanism for its occurrence. This work led to changes in amino acid solutions that are now used routinely in neonatal hyperalimentation. I could go on describing uh, uh, Phil's scientific contributions. However, what impresses me most about Phil is the breadth of his knowledge, his spirit of innovation, and his willingness to promote others' contributions. While encouraging his colleagues to push the envelope, he has always remained comfortable with change, giving credit to others, enjoying the success for his patients, humbly, humorously, and in a self-effacing manner. I first met Phil in the late 1970s. He taught me more than neonatology. For example, here we are contemplating the consequences of Phil having volunteered us to sit on a pedestal while people threw objects at a release latch uh, which would send us into a, a vat of ice cold water. Here is a picture of the drenched doctors, a consequence of the accuracy of our NICU graduates and colleagues, once having put ourselves in the line of fire. I'm sure that crowds would still come, probably now in even greater numbers. But not all was frivolity. This was a more common scene at Stanford. Phil is one of the originals in neonatology a neonatologist, neonatologist, one of, our, one of our history's best baby doctors and an enduring figure. His nurturing and jocular presence among us has had far-reaching and powerful effects on many of our careers. And his students are now spread across the entire country having roles in pediatric gastroenterology and neonatology. Over and over again, Phil has been there for his students and his career is reflected in them and I am one of those grateful students. So I believe it's, it's most appropriate that we recognize Phil Sunshine now for his contributions as one of the founding fathers of modern neonatology, one of its great leaders who is still among us and one of our dearest teachers. There's no greater pleasure than the one I have right now in acknowledging Phil's contributions and introducing him to you as uh, a Hewlett awardee, Phil. Is it on? Thank you. I take off my mask. You're not supposed to, Phil. Thank you, David, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, if he had uh, just talked about my shortcomings and failures, we'd be here all morning. I also want to thank the Department of Medicine for and the Selection Committee for choosing me for this honor and bestowing it upon me today. Uh, when I looked at the list of all the other people who won this award, I have no idea why I'm even here. Uh, the talk is uh, my journey through Stanford, 56. It should be a question mark after 202, but uh, I had hoped to last a little bit longer. <laughs> uh, I grew up in Denver and I had very little knowledge of, uh, of Stanford except for uh, uh, learning about Hank Lucetti's one had a set shot and Clark Shaughnessy's development of the T formation that led the Stanford football team to the victory uh, over Nebraska in the 1941 Rose Bowl. And uh, that until I met uh, the, uh, this gentleman, uh, Dr. Robert Hamilton Alway. I was a medical student at the University of Colorado and uh, Bob Alway was recruited to be the chairman of pediatrics. He had been at Stanford. And every time we made rounds, he'd usually bring up what a great place Stanford was. And I had no idea why he was still at uh, Colorado. Uh, he had a lot of little mannerisms and uh, little uh, tweaks. And I was a keen observer of these. And uh, I took off on him in our junior class play. And he thought this parody was uh, really funny. In fact, he sat behind my parents uh, during the presentations, and we developed a pretty good relationship considering, you know, a wise-ass junior student and a professor of uh, pediatrics. But he was uh, a wonderful teacher, and he really turned me on to pediatrics. 
In 55, I graduated. Uh, he went on and was recruited back to Stanford as chairman of pediatrics uh, when Stanford was still in the city. Uh, after my year in Baltimore, which seemed that I spent a decade there at that time, I uh, called Bob and asked him if he'd give me a uh, position on his residency staff. He did, had a wonderful year, and then was drafted into the United States Navy. I went off to the Navy. Bob went off to become the acting and then the permanent dean of the medical school, the appointment of which was really orchestrated by uh, Henry Kaplan. Uh, Henry Kaplan had a lot to say about the way the medical school was going at that time. He was being heavily recruited by Harvard and Terman and uh, Wally Sterling said, no, what is it gonna take to keep you here at Stanford? And he said, uh, bring in some other really great people. And he orchestrated the recruitment of uh, Dr. Arthur Kornberg, who uh, was the uh, chairman of uh, <clears throat> microbiology at WashU in St. Louis. And he brought a group of outstanding young biochemists, uh, including Paul Berg, who went on to win the Nobel Prize. And when Letterberg heard about this, uh, he was sort of interested in coming to Stanford as well. And Henry facilitated that uh, recruitment. So with uh, Kornberg, Letterberg, and Abram Goldstein, who was the chairman of pharmacology, uh, they created an unbelievable basic science program here at Stanford that was probably as good as any on the planet. Uh, Alway remained uh, the dean for approximately seven years, and he was instrumental really in getting the school to move from San Francisco, uh, where there was really no way to grow uh, down to Palo Alto campus. This had been talked about for years, and he probably was the catalyst that uh, accomplished this. And with it uh, came a uh, full-time faculty, uh, a five-year uh, program in uh, medical school so that the students could spend time in research. And uh, during the time uh, that he was here, he recruited over 126 uh, full-time faculty and seven new department chairmen, most of which were outstanding individuals. He made a few mistakes along the way, but uh, rectified that over a period of time. Uh, and one of these uh, people that he recruited is uh, pictured here, Norman Kretschmer. Uh, <clears throat> I got out of the Navy about three weeks after the uh, year had started, and I was introduced to Dr. Kretschmer, who was only 35 years old at the time. Uh, was an MD, PhD, and Norman was also very effective in recruiting outstanding young faculty to join them uh, in the new uh, medical school. Uh, at that time, the school was divided as a Palo Alto side, Stanford side. There were two departments of medicine, two departments of surgery, two departments of radiology. Uh, Norman couldn't handle this. He said, we're gonna have a unified pediatric service. So he uh, recruited Harry Jennison, who was a pediatrician at the Palo Alto Clinic, and he made him an associate uh, uh, chairman of the department. And he was able to convince the community physicians that all patients that were admitted to the, uh, to the hospital would be jointly managed by the physician as well as the resident uh, staff. And this worked out amazingly well. They bought into it. We did not compete with them for general pediatric patients and they would use our faculty for specialty care. And uh, on rounds, there was a community physician and a full-time academician. So the students and the house staff were able to learn from both sides. And this has continued, I think, even till the present time. Although I haven't been on the ward in 20 years, so I'm not sure. But it was great, and I always, uh, when I was attending, I would always try to pick out one of the bright uh, community physicians so I could learn a lot about pediatrics. Um, when I uh, was a resident also, uh, <clears throat> uh, we in pediatrics did not have all the subspecialists, so we had to rely upon the Department of Medicine to provide uh, uh, guidance in infectious disease, in uh, cardiology for a period of time, 
uh, neurology and, and all the other specialties. And uh, as chief resident, we had access to all of these people. And to give you an example, I had a, a young girl who had uh, cuclomerulonephritis and uh, her blood pressure didn't, wouldn't come down. Pressure said, go consult with Dr. Reitan, chairman of medicine. So I walked over to his office. I didn't have to call, press one, press two, press three. And uh, he came over and saw the uh, girl with me, did a beautiful exam. And he says, what's your problem? And I said, she got hypertension. He said, oh, is that right? I said, what do you think we ought to do? He says, I, I'd use it barbital. I said, well, how much should I give her? He says, oh, don't give her anything. You take the peanut barbital because <laughs> you're the one that's worried. She's going to do fine. Her blood pressure will come down in a couple of weeks. Nothing to worry about. But that was a close interaction that we had with the faculty at that time. And it was a wonderful experience. When I finished uh, <clears throat> my uh, residency, I didn't really want to go into practice. So Norman talked me into taking a fellowship with him and uh, the, you know, studying the developmental enzymes uh, in the gastrointestinal tract. And as David pointed out, I was fortunate. I was able to work with uh, Dr. Odekar Koldowski, a Czech uh, who was an established investigator who had spent uh, nine months with us. And uh, we accomplished so many interesting studies. Uh, we would work five days a week, set up the experiment in the morning. I go make rounds, come back late afternoon. He had the results and he said, sunshine, we have made a great discovery. <laughs> Even though the things went bad, I said, this experiment screwed up. He says, we have made a discovery not to do this experiment again. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, and David mentioned, this is one of our uh, papers that was published in Nature. And uh, uh, really led us to understand that the turnover rate in immature uh, animals, and probably, although we don't have the data, uh, in immature babies, preemies that have damage to their gut, that they don't repair it as quickly as would an older child, <coughs> older child or an adult. Uh, in the Kretcher's laboratory, he had visiting students and visiting uh, young faculty whose professors would send them to Stanford to work with Norman to learn biochemical techniques. We have people from uh, Sweden, uh, uh, Denmark, Belgium, France, Israel, Japan, Chile, Brazil, you name it, people were there. He had two 400 square, square feet labs that uh, people would work. There were usually two to three fellows from visiting countries that, uh, would work there. And like I say, I was lucky <clears throat> to, to work with Dr. Uh, Koldowski. Uh, when I finished my fellowship, uh, Norman appointed me as an instructor in the Department of Pediatrics. And he says, I want you to set up a clinic in pediatric GI. At that time, there were only four pediatric GI programs in the country. And I set it up, I figured, well, I knew a lot about lactose malabsorption. I knew a lot about congenital malformations. But after about four months, I was in way over my head. And I went to Norman, I said, you know, I gotta take a fellowship. He said, you don't need a fellowship. You go work with Murray Davidson in Bronx. In three, week, three months, he'll teach you everything you have to know about GI. I went off, worked with Davidson, learned a lot, Came back, but it, I still need a lot of help. And thank God, uh, Keith Taylor was here as uh, head of uh, GI in the Department of Medicine. And he helped me. And then he recruited uh, Gary Gray and Peter Gregory. And uh, later on, uh, Gabe Garcia, who not only uh, helped me uh, in the management of uh, these patients, teaching me procedures, and also educating some of our fellows, including Dr. Kerner, who is here today, and uh, terrific help. And I was able to run that clinic. Uh, it was a single person clinic, single person division uh, with very good fellow help until uh, 1980. 
when uh, John Kerner took over the program in uh, pediatric GI. And I felt badly about leaving him with this, but within a year, he more than tripled the number of patients, uh, had established instead of a one half day clinic was a couple of days a week, and also encouraged other people to join him. And he really did a terrific job, single-handedly for almost five years before he got help. But my real interest was in uh, newborn medicine. So GI was sort of a, you know, secondary uh, program, but uh, I was really turned on to uh, neonatology by this gentleman, who Gluck. Gluck came to Stanford in 1959. Uh, he was our really first neonatologist. So his training consisted of spending a year with Bill Silverman. And he really turned every uh, uh, resident on to study of the newborn. He only stayed here for one year. And uh, I worked with him through my, uh, that one year as a resident. And then uh, when he left, uh, Sumner Yaffe came, and then Ir uh, Schaefer, and then finally, uh, Norman in 1964 was able to recruit uh, a real other neonatologist, uh, Dr. Klaus. And Marshall was trained at the CBRI under Julius Comro, and uh, his main interest was in uh, using a artificial surfactant to treat babies who had respiratory distress syndrome, hilo membrane disease. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, he went to uh, uh, Singapore working with Bill Tooley and Ernie Cotton, uh, Colorado, and uh, Bill from uh, San Francisco, using this in the center that had 20,000 deliveries a year, large numbers of preterm infants, and they tried to use this as a form of therapy. It didn't work. They tried acetylcholine to open up the pulmonary blood flow. It worked in some patients and he brought that back to Stanford and that really didn't work too well. But he taught me a great deal about neonatology, pulmonary medicine, but his main contribution was to allow parents to come into the nursery. Up until this time, uh, it was forbidden for parents to come in and see their babies, mostly because of worries <clears throat> of infection. So about two or three days before the baby was ready to go home, he had a little room where the parents could learn how to take care of their infant, but the rest of the time couldn't come in. Uh, Tim Oliver, who was at the University of Washington, did a study and he showed that you didn't need cap, mask, gown and glove to go into the nursery, but you could come in, wash your hands carefully, don't come in when you're sick and you could take care of the patient. And he showed that over a two year period, there was no increased incidence of infection. So we had a resident in radiology and his wife, they just had a preterm infant. He would come in at night to do his, uh, you know, uh, dictate his charts. And she would sit at a little glass window, look again to see her baby. And the nurses complained, you know, She's driving us nuts. Marshall said, maybe we ought to let her in. We said, why not let everyone in? And so uh, we thought that would be a great idea, but uh, uh, Cliff Barnett, who was an anthropologist and uh, <clears throat> uh, Herb Lederman, a psychiatrist said, you gotta study this. So for a two year period, we did a study. Parents were allowed in for four months, the next four months they weren't and so on. And at the end of two years, when they published their paper, they showed that initially there was a difference in the relationship, the mother's relationship to their babies. But after two years, you really could not tell the difference. Well, this opened up the nursery to parents. And we were one of the first, if not the first nursery to do that. And now of course, uh, NICU is a family oriented unit, parents are in, siblings are in. Uh, it was changed a lot during the uh, recent pandemic, but it just opened up the nursery to the families and it improved the outcome of care. Next person I'd like to talk about is uh, Dr. William Daly, Joe Daly. 
I met him when he was a, <clears throat> a junior medical student and I was a resident. Uh, he, his wife just had a little girl with a T fistula and the baby got great care. And I think this turned him on <clears throat> to uh, pediatrics. The baby recognized right away, Harry Jettison was uh, the doctor. And I think Blake Wilbur uh, repaired the T fistula and she did well. But Joe was really turned on to pediatrics. The other thing that happened was uh, we had a anesthesiologist here by the name of Vern Thomas. And he would be in the nursery a lot. And he kept saying, you know, these babies with respiratory distress syndrome are going into respiratory failure. We're not doing anything for them except keeping them warm, not handling them so much. We got to support their ventilation. And there were papers out <clears throat> by Ian Donald, who was a Scotsman, who had been to, uh, uh, placed babies on ventilators way back in the early 50s. Uh, Millie Stallman at the uh, Madder built had used a negative pressure ventilator. And we debated, you know, what if the baby's on and then the baby's damaged and the baby's lived? And all, all I can tell you is procrastination walk. So we didn't, weren't doing anything. And finally, uh, one weekend when uh, neither Irv Schaefer or, or, or Marshall Clauser and I were on uh, service, Baby came in, Vern Thomas was here, talked the pediatrician into putting the baby on a ventilator. And Joe Daly was one of the um, residents who was involved and the baby survived. And boy, we said, this is you know, phenomenal. So we thought this is a chance to really help infants. Nurses bought into it, became very enthusiastic. And at the end of uh, Joe's residency, he showed this interest in uh, uh, neonatology. So Kretschmer said, you have to go to Sweden, work with Peter Karlberg in Gothenburg, and you'll learn pulmonary physiology. So he went off and uh, uh, Karlberg was working on impedance pneumography uh, to evaluate pulmonary blood flow. Joe took this idea back and what he did was if you placed electrodes on either side of the chest, measure impedance, the baby takes a breath in, there's a change of impedance. If there's no change of impedance over 15 seconds, 20 seconds, an alarm goes off. So he worked with a uh, biomedical engineer, Frank Dominguez, and they built this machine. This is one of six, the first six, uh, apnea monitors that were developed. And Dominguez started manufacturing them, cost him about 50 to $100 to build one of these, sold them for 300, and then sold the company to Air Shields. He made millions, Stanford got nothing out of this. And Daly got a free trip to Mexico City to attend the International Pediatric Society meeting. <laughs> Uh, Joe also worked to improve our way of ventilation using different pressures <clears throat> and rates to come up with optimal settings. As this is our Bennett PR2. Hospital wouldn't buy us a good ventilator, but these were sturdy, couldn't do much damage. And then we noticed there was one ventilator that had a sticky valve. And that ventilator, we were able to really manage patients much more readily. There was a long inspiratory phase as shown at the bottom. Inadvertently, there was an end positive pressure that you couldn't really see it on the, on the, uh, on the uh, monitor. But when we measured it, we found that there was an end pressure of about two to three centimeters of water. And this really coincided, well, I'm gonna go back, uh, with a group up at UCSF. Uh, <clears throat> who uh, started to use continuous positive airway pressure to treat babies on ventilators. And that really changed the way that babies who were monitored or cared for on ventilators. So now every ventilator that's built has a component of end positive pressure. 
But it was really because of this sticking valve that we sort of inadvertently uh, fell upon this. I'm going to digress a little bit, but in 1963, uh, Patrick Bovier Kennedy was born and uh, the son of a president of the United States. And uh, this baby was cared for at the Boston Children's Hospital, was given care that was usually provided uh, by the group there. And uh, everything failed ended up being put in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, which really hastened his demise because he quit breathing. But when this baby died, it uh, made the nation aware of the problems of preterm birth, problems of respiratory <clears throat> insufficiency, and suddenly there are large amounts of uh, money available. And we always said if the baby had been born in Stanford, it would have been a piece of cake. You know, kid was 34 weeks, big baby, weighed over two kilo. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the docs in Baltimore, in Boston, called Nellie Stallman, who was down in uh, Vanderbilt, and said, bring your negative pressure ventilator up here to take care of the baby. And she said, if you want me to take care of the baby, bring him here and we'll take care of him. Well, obviously that didn't happen. Uh, <clears throat> Joe Daly left to help run the uh, perinatal program in Arizona, and we were able to recruit uh, Johnny Johnson. Johnny uh, was a Stanford graduate. He uh, interned and took his residency at Hopkins, came back and was a fellow with Norman Kretschmer, and we were able to talk him into becoming a neonatologist. Well, he was a shining light. Uh, he uh, began to work on bilirubin metabolism and had a, a research assistant, Clint Ostrander, who was a chemical engineer. And they devised techniques of measuring carbon monoxide in expired air. And, you know, for every molecule of heme that's broken down, <clears throat> there is a molecule of iron, molecule of bilirubin, and a molecule of carbon monoxide. So by measuring carbon monoxide in expired air, you could get a very good idea of the rate of bilirubin production. He also did uh, other things. And David mentioned the fact that uh, uh, we got involved <clears throat> in the care, uh, in providing intravenous nutrition uh, to preterm infants. This was developed by Stan Dudrick and Wilmore and Rhodes Lab in uh, Philadelphia, which was a godsend. And it, uh, where we could get increased protein into babies who were not able to take adequate uh, feedings by, uh, by mouth. And what John found out was uh, Stanford has just developed a microassay for ammonia. And he found that in these babies, the ammonia levels were going way up. And not only that, but there was evidence of increased transaminase and uh, increased uh, uh, in the, uh, direct bilirubin as well. And we also found at that time that the solutions that the companies made of hydrolysis of either casein or fibrin products had large amounts of uh, ammonia. David presented these data uh, at the, I mean, Johnny presented these data at the national meeting and immediately the manufacturers used all the amino acid solutions, got rid of the abundance of ammonia in the uh, solutions, and we really didn't run into many problems after that. Those were major contributions that John made. Uh, <clears throat> uh, while John was still here, he was the uh, associate director of the nurseries. Uh, we had a rash of babies, four infants who developed the necrotizing pneumonitis. These are babies who had gotten through their initial respiratory problems, seemed to be growing, and then suddenly were very, very sick. And we consulted Ann Yeager who had recently been appointed to the uh, faculty by Herb Schulman uh, to help us figure out what was going on. 
And she really dug deeply into this, found out that uh, the babies had CMD pneumonia and most likely got this through blood transfusions. They received more than 30 ml of blood from CMD positive donors. Uh, she felt that that would lead to their problem. Well, she worked this out and she published these, these data after working with our blood bank so that when babies in our nursery received blood, it had to be CMB negative. And after that, we never had another case of CMB uh, through uh, transfusions. About this time, they were starting to recognize an increased incidence of HIV, late 70s, early 80s. Blood banks were not testing for HIV antibodies in blood. And we started to see patients coming down with HIV secondary to blood transfusions. Well, it turns out that if you're CMV negative, you're almost assuredly HIV negative. So none of our babies or babies who followed Jaeger's protocol ever uh, got CM, uh, HIV through blood transfusions. Those centers that didn't follow those rules ended up having a new number of babies uh, with this entity. And uh, I think Anne, who unfortunately passed away at a very young age, saved thousands of babies from getting us through transfusions. One of the last people I want to discuss is uh, pictured here, Dr. Remington. Uh, I met him in 1956. He was an intern on the uh, Cal service at the San Francisco General. I was a first year resident. He was here with uh, three other brilliant young people from the University of Illinois. And uh, I recognized right away this guy is something special. He not only insisted that his patients get optimal care. He was always available for his patients. He was just a tremendous driving force. And uh, he went on, as you know, to become the world's authority on toxoplasmosis and the care of the immunocompromised uh, patient. Uh, we rehooked up in the uh, uh, early 1960s when he was recruited to come to the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, where he set up the, the Toxo lab. We uh, uh, collaborated on several papers, one of which is listed here. They felt that IgM and blood, uh, if you uh, examined cord blood, would identify babies with intrauterine infections. Well, we studied over 5,000 infants, and it turns out most of the kids who had elevated IgM had this because of the placental leaks and not because they were infected. You know, Jack was a remarkable individual. He was a terrific athlete. And many of you don't know this, but he was really a very good pugilist. And he boxed under the CYO, the Catholic Youth Organization auspices, uh, under the direction of Tony Zale, who was a middleweight champion of the world. And I think one of the first things uh, Zale told uh, Jack was, before we proceed, we're gonna to have to figure out how to protect your nose. <laughs> well, Jack and I can lab, we also, every baby that was admitted to the nursery uh, ended up uh, getting uh, toxo levels measured. And uh, we found that a large number of babies had toxo antibodies, but that they were not sick. And so uh, I said, Jack, you gotta figure out a way to do, figure out, if this is transplacentally past mother's antibodies or it's the babies. And uh, within a week, he called me and he worked out the assay. Immediately called all his collaborators and uh, instituted <clears throat> the, uh, uh, this as a method of um, separating the babies and mother's uh, titers. He always gave me credit for giving him the idea, but ideas are dime a dozen. He took this to the hilt and uh, really saved a lot of inputs. He was amazing, he had a 600 publications, 11 patents, several textbooks, including uh, 
textbook of infectious disease in infants and in the fetus and newborns, which is now in its ninth edition. I could talk all day about Shumway, but just briefly, I met him when I was a senior uh, chief resident, went down to the uh, intensive care unit that was a combination of both adult and pediatrics, following a little girl who had uh, uh, her ASD repaired. And I saw this gentleman asleep on a gurney next to her. It was about 10 and 11 o'clock at night. I said, uh, is this a dad? They said, well, that's Dr. Shumway. He's been here all afternoon monitoring this baby. I feel God, if this is a guy that not only does great surgery, but make sure that his babies or patients are getting great care. I was amazed. Uh, everybody knows all the contributions he made, but when we wanted to set up our ECMO program, uh, Norm provided the perfusionist, provided the surgeon, laboratory animals. We have to be able to show that we can manage a laboratory animal on ECMO before we became certified and really changed, uh, helped us uh, become certified. Uh, very unassuming guy, but uh, what a powerful and contributing member to uh, this medical school. Uh, last two, couple slides. Everybody knows Dr. Stevenson. Uh, we recruited him or maybe he recruited us uh, <clears throat> in, uh, late 1970s to come here as a fellow in neonatology. He uh, been a graduate of Stanford, went to medical school at Washington U, or the University of Washington, where his dad was chief of, uh, was a pediatric surgeon and took his residency there. He came down, immediately started working with John Johnson. He, I never met a person who worked so hard and was so accomplished in carrying out not only uh, laboratory, but clinical investigation, but seemed to be always available. And uh, my wife and I took uh, his wife out to dinner, his wife and uh, David at the old village pub. And on the way home, my wife said, you better be really nice to that guy. I said, why? She says, he's gonna end up being your boss. <laughs> and uh, you know, David made many contributions, too numerable to name. But not only did he take over when I went to uh, Los Angeles, but he also uh, built up the program and uh, set up uh, satellite nurseries in, uh, in <clears throat> El Camino and uh, Sequoia, Santa Cruz, and at Washington uh, Township Hospital. Uh, he's been recruited by many schools to come as chairman. He's even been recruited to be a provost of the university. He's remained here and he, during the time that he was also the head of the NICU, he was also the acting head of HEMONC in our department, acting head of GI. He was even the acting chairman of orthopedic surgery while they were looking for a chairman in fact, many of the uh, people in the department wanted him to stay on as a full-time chairman. Uh, when he uh, relinquished, relinquished his uh, stay, uh, I should mention that uh, Herb Schwartz here was the one that uh, put uh, David on to the idea of studying hemoxygenase. And lastly, I just like, not lastly, but I'd like to point out the gentleman here, William Bennett, who I knew as a medical student, came down from the University of Alaska, was brilliant during his uh, year as uh, first year as a resident, uh, first year as a medical student. He was also a TA in structural biology, also known as anatomy. And during his second and third years, wrote a text on a handbook of uh, pediatric uh, pharmacology. Uh, brilliant guy, I learned more from him than I had from uh, cardiopulmonary physiology than I had from any of my previous uh, mentors. It reminded me, Norm Kretcher told me when uh, I started as a faculty member, remember the Stanford students here are really much smarter than you are. So you have a little bit of experience, treat them well, and they'll teach you more than they'll learn from you. And he was a perfect example of that. Uh, always, they're humble, 
won many awards, as did David, and was president of the chairman of the subboard of neonatal perinatal medicine board of pediatrics. This young lady, uh, it says the woman behind the man, but actually this is Beth Sunshine. She's the actually the woman before the man. Uh, she's been with me. We've been together for almost 60 years. He almost single-handedly raised every one of our five kids, made them feel good about themselves, encouraged them, uh, gave them uh, positive feedback all the time, and they've all turned out to be uh, contributing members of society. All graduated in four years from college and all went on to uh, be, uh, get advanced degrees in their respective fields. And they really are contributing members of our society. And I wanna thank Ron J. Wong who put this slide uh, PowerPoint together for me. He's done about a hundred others of these for me over the past 10 years. And I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Uh, if there's any, we're just at nine o'clock, but if there's any questions here, anybody would like to ask, we'll give it a moment to see if anybody has any. I just want to say, Dr. Sunshine, thank you so much. That was such an honor to hear all the amazing work you've been doing. And I've been reading so much online the last month. Uh, unbelievable work that you've done to care for people. Yeah, only because I have really good people working with me or working oh. against me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for everybody again who came here in person. And we had a huge uh, uh, showing online as well. Thanks for everybody for sticking with us and being with us today as always. Um, we'll keep everybody updated with the, everything else we're doing with the usual updates. Thank you again, Dr. Sunshine. It was such an honor. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>